Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I guess I'm okay. <laughs> Good. I've decided to go 2D with my Tensegrity project for a bit. Okay. Because uh, I was looking at the math and it's an indeterminate structure. <laughs> <laughs> You mean the 3D version? Yes, the 3D okay. version is 2D not 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 or shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, usually the 2D math works out better than the 3D math. <laughs> yeah, and the triangles work better than the hexagons. <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. So, <laughs> so I've got a, um, a triangle prism that works, and I'm going to get the 2D map to work. And I'm going to say, well, I need to get the whole thing together, but uh, so far, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck with that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have to introduce this to my professors this afternoon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, okay. Like, yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we want the whole thing. It's like, <laughs> you guys even know what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. so. I think it's in, like I'm reading two sets of different maths. And one is on tensegrity, and the other one is on the vertex model. Okay. Yeah. So I, if I could somehow combine them, I, I could just write a thesis and be done. Right. <laughs> I don't think it's that easy. In other words. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it for you and send it, send it to you. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, why don't we talk about Google Summer of Code? So if you go to the Neurostars page, and I think a lot of people have already uh, gotten this information from INCF, but it looks like our project for this year is posted on uh, their INCF's uh, discourse. So they have this discourse. Uh, they run called Neurostars.org, and it's uh, as you know. There's also a lot of things here on neuroimaging, so that's how they got the name Neurostars. But they post a lot of this stuff on um, the projects for the year. So this year's projects are posted. There are a lot of projects being sponsored by INCF, maybe about 20 or 30, well, maybe about 20. And uh, we're project four, so actually 4.1. So we have Graph Neural Networks is the title of the project. Uh, it's sponsored by the Open Worm Foundation as well as INCF. So we'll be working. The Diva Worm projects are all through the Open Worm Foundation. And it's just usually, you know, we have to have an org that we sort of people interact with during the community period. So not only would you be interacting with Diva Worm, but the larger Open Worm group. Um, so yeah, the project is basically the same as last year. We're looking for people to develop graph neural networks and graph neural network uh, representations, graph embeddings, things like that. So we have, during the project period, we have sort of three steps that you can follow. Uh, so wait a minute. Uh, so yeah, we have, uh, I think it was like two years ago, Jia Hong Li, who's actually sort of took the initiative in the first year of this project to sort of define the parameters of it. He developed a pipeline with three parts. Uh, the first one is refining a means to segment raw data and incorporate it in the Diva Worm pipeline, which is basically image segmentation and making sure the input data looks good. Uh, so we've worked on that a lot, uh, both in 2022 and then last year with Hamanchu Shogol, who was also in the project. So, you know, we're doing that. We That's kind of been worked out already. But you may, you know, may have things to contribute there if you want. The second part of the pipeline is refining our method for deriving graph embeddings. So, you know, Hamanchi worked on graph embeddings a little bit last summer. Um, and he worked on things that, you know, went from graph embeddings to topological data analysis. But, you know... The summer being what it is, it's just that summer period, you know, you didn't have time to really work it out all the way. So between Jia Hong's work and 
uh, Wataru Kamakari's work and Hamachu Shogul's work, that's basically the bulk of the work that's been done on this. And you'll find that in the uh, GitHub repository. So there's a GitHub repository here, devolearn slash devograph, and, and a lot of the work is in there. And then the third part of the pipeline is more tightly integrating devograph as a network structure discovery module of devolearn. So this is where we're looking for people who can take a, a graph embedding, create a graph embedding, and then turn that into other things that are useful to the Devo Learn platform. So the Devo Learn platform is a machine learning platform for segmenting images. So in a sense, some of that work has already could be been contributed to step one, but step three actually involves, you know, maybe a more sort of graph oriented approach to Devo Devo Learn. So you know, taking the uh, segmented image data and turning it into graphs and then doing things with graph theory and and network theory. Now, I don't expect people to jump on three, uh, you know, like in a very sophisticated way, but we can talk about how you might be able to contribute to three. Um, and, you know, I, I we, we do a lot of that in the group. We talk about networks. And we have, I have some references. I think I put some references at the end. I did not. Well, we have some references that one can uh, consult to uh, work on that. Uh, so basically, we're looking for people who are good at, you know, uh, kind of working on their own, working out their problem on their own. This is kind of a hard problem because graph neural networks are uh, pretty hard to, they're pretty opaque <laughs> in a lot of ways. They're not as, uh, you know, not as easy to understand as some of the basic machine learning techniques. So it might be a little bit of a challenge. But, you know, that's something that, you know, and again, you know, you just take a piece of this and work on it. So the idea is that we're having this project that we've had the last two years and you take a piece of it and, you know, or you can work on refining something that already exists and you can build a project around that. So uh, what can you do before GSOC? You can get involved in the OpenWorm Slack. So we have a Slack for OpenWorm. You know, not don't just look at DevoWorm, look at all the channels, look at all the different things going on in the project. We have uh, all sorts of, you know, uh, OpenWorm is built on secondary data. We have a lot of movement data. We have a lot of other types of uh, cellular level data. And so this is something that we can, you know, if you're interested in using other types of data, we can do that. But the focus is going to be on C. elegans development for the summer. We also have a website, divaworm.weebly.com. This is our, uh, our group website here. We have here all sorts of things. We have publications under academic output. We have uh, previous Google, Google Summer of Code projects under educations, notebooks, and media. We have a number of public lectures, which maybe will give you some background into some of the things we're thinking about and some of the work we've done on networks. We have all sorts of things here. So uh, definitely check that out, as well as the OpenWorm Foundation website. Uh, we also have a GitHub. So this is the GitHub for DevoGraph. And so this is under in the Devo Learn organization. So Devo Learn is, of course, the main package that we're kind of working towards building modules of. Devo Graph is sort of separate because we haven't worked it out. It's not incorporated into the main release, but we're trying to work out in a lot of the details of this before we actually make a formal release. Uh, so yeah, we have. Stage one here, stage two here, and we have some other things. You know, this this uh, repo will likely undergo a refactoring before the beginning of uh, Google Summer of Code. But, you know, we've been working on a lot of things. So, you know, we have the resources. We just have to, like, put these things together. And, uh, you know, really for the proposal, you don't need to do a lot of work. You might make a couple of commits to this repo, 
but I'm looking for people who can propose something that is both interesting, well, three things, interesting uh, and, you know, useful and uh, sort of within the time scope of the project. So, you know, you only have, this is a 350 hour project, as they say in the application. Um, that means that, you know, you only have a 350 hour window to do this in. So, you know, you have like 20 hours a week, every week in the summer. Uh, and so you, you don't have infinite amount of time. It's not like a year long project. So you have to propose something that's within the scope of that, but also interesting and useful. And so that's what we have. Uh, in terms of, yeah, so the GitHub repo is here. You, you know, you, I would suggest that people fork it and look it over and ask questions about it. Uh, we also have Devo Learn, which is the organization that this is under. So this is the main package that we work on. Uh, we have a number of releases of this. Uh, we have a lot of different, uh, last summer, uh, Sushmanth, uh Ready was working on a number of different modules, things like CellSAM, which is the segment anything model. And uh, he was working on putting our models on Hugging Face. So the Devo Learn modules are a nucleus segmenter, a membrane segmenter, and a lineage population model. And so all those are necessary for segmenting C. elegans cells. Uh, not only just kind of static images, but dynamic images across the lineage tree, which if you read a little bit about, uh, I think I have some things pinned to the uh, Slack channel, you'll be able to read about basic C. elegans development and you'll know what some of these terms are. So I suggest that you read a little bit about C. elegans development to get uh, sort of oriented to some of these terms. But these are three things that we use for, basically we can plug that into that step one in uh, DevoGraph. And then step two is turning these things into graph embeddings and then, or the segmented images into graph embeddings. And then step three is doing other things with the gra those graph embeddings and with networks. That's where we are. Please, uh, okay, now for people interested in Google Summer of Code, I'm going to go over some of our community resources. And some of these are going to be things that you'll want to check out before you apply, just to get a taste for what our community does and what we're trying to accomplish. So the first thing you want to do is join the uh, Openworm Slack. That's the Openworm Foundation. And there's a link in the description of the project on Neurostars. So please join as when you can. If you need an invite, let me know. Contact me and I can invite you to the Slack. The Slack, we do our weekly meetings. We record those, put those on YouTube, and I usually put those in the channel for people to check out after the meeting is concluded. So we often have people come synchronously to the meeting, but people also check out our meeting asynchronously as well. And we do this weekly on a weekly basis. We also have people, you know, members of the channel who post things they're interested in collaborating or they have interesting articles or topics that they want to discuss. So it's really, you know, it's a good resource to be involved in the community, asynchronously especially. We also have a channel, Devo Learn Devo Graph, and that's actually more focused on machine learning and deep learning. And so if you're interested in the Graph Neural Networks project, you might want to join in in this channel and check out some of the things that have been put in the channel over the last couple of years. We have a number of graph learning resources here. We have a number of other types of image segmentation resources and the like. Uh, Devo Learn and Devo Graph and Devo Worm are both public channels. So when you get into the Slack, just you know look for those channels and join or let me know in the main DevoWorm channel and I can invite you. The OpenWorm Foundation also has other channels, so there are a lot of things going on in that community. Uh, there's C302, which is a simulation platform for uh, C. elegans neurons. We have uh, a data channel, which is where we talk about open data sets. We have a community channel. We have a general channel, which is where most of the announcements are. Also a science channel. The way that the OpenWorm GitHub works is that it sends notifications of different issues that are being worked on 
to the channels. So in the cha science channel, you can see that there was an issue that was closed by Hussein Aether uh, on February 22nd. There's another issue, one number 114, create sample neural ML connect down output that was uh, that's being worked on. This is by Steve Larson. And so this is, you can keep abreast of the different GitHub issues that are salient to people in the community. People are currently working on things and those things get posted to, I think the science channel and I think the C302. Unfortunately, we don't have that configured for DivaWorm, but we don't really operate on a, a issues based system in DivaWorm. So the OpenWorm GitHub uh, organization is at github.com slash openworm. And so you'll find here, you'll find a lot of things that are beyond DivaWorm that are uh, incorporate the entire OpenWorm Foundation. So OpenWorm is a uh, nonprofit foundation. It's a 501c3. And there's an umbrella of projects under OpenWorm that involve simulating uh, C. elegans, the nematode. So we have a number of different projects going on for biophysics, for neural network, you know, simulation, for development, for movement, all these things. And so we have a number of repos that you might want to check out. There's C302, there's Geppetto, which is a simulation platform for uh, web-based applications. Uh, there's Channel Worm, which is ion channel specific. Um, Vahid, who attends the meetings currently, it has a lot of expertise in the area of ion channels and their you know, modeling the ion channels in the context of C. elegans neurons. We also have a Docker file, which is pinned here. So if you're really interested, you can run, you can download the Docker file in this release 0.9.4. You can run it on your own machine. You can get a sense, you can get a taste of the different simulations that OpenWorm does. And, you know, if you are handy with Docker files, you can get it to run. You do need a bit of memory on your machine. But you can get a sense of all the different simulations. So there's a biophysics simulation. There's a, a neural network simulation. There's an ion channel simulation. Uh, one of the things we'd like to do in DivaWorm is to develop uh, something to put in that Docker file. We still haven't found the right thing, but that's something we're looking for doing. And so that's the OpenWorm uh, GitHub repo. Uh, the GitHub organization, if you feel like contributing there, you can check out their issues. And that would, I think, go a long way towards uh, showing that you're really involved in open source. So OpenWorm also has a website. This is our sponsoring nonprofit organization. So in, a, in addition to INCF, which is sort of our Google Summer of Code organization, we have OpenWorm, which is our sponsor sponsoring organization. So this is a, uh, a non-profit organization. Uh, we have a number of things. So this is a animation that shows the different things that are going on in OpenWorm. So building the first digital life form, open source, explore the worm. So there's a worm browser here, which is browser.openworm.org. This allows you to see the worm in 3D. So you can zoom in on model of C. elegans. The nematode C. elegans looks like this. It's about, in real life, it's about a millimeter or so long, and it has 302 neurons and 959 cells in the hermaphrodite. So it's a, a relatively small system. We can look at a lot of things in very high detail in a way that's not, uh, doesn't have a lot of biological variation in it, although that's not entirely true as you'll find out if you come to our meetings. You can populate this model with different, so you can go through the layers of the model. This is just kind of the cuticle with no nervous system. And then we can move down through this. Uh, we can move through the layers of this model and we can see progressively more detail in terms of the muscles, in terms of the neurons, and the nerves that you see in the nervous system of the worm. So you don't see the <clears throat> all cells of the worm, but you do see the nerve neurons, the nerves, you see the uh, different aspects of that, then you see the muscle, and then you see the epidermis or the cuticle on top. So you can go through the different layers 
it's almost like looking at a microscopy image where you go through the, the uh, focal layers, but you're dropping things out. You're seeing sort of all the aspects of the worm nervous system. And it's, it's allied structures. So that's the Open Room Browser. There's also Cybernetic, which is a biophysics simulator. And that's, that's open source. And this simulates the worm moving through different types of physical media. So the worm moves through the soil, usually. Uh, there's Devo Worm. So this is something where you can just go to our resources, to our website, which I'll show in a minute. There's also the Open Room Browser, NeuroML Connectome. This is a Connectome model that ha is coded in NeuroML. There's open source visualization using Geppetto. So this is a simulation platform. And then WormSim, where we also have another simulation uh, mechanical model of the muscular system. So the Open Room Browser is open source. It's available on the GitHub, uh, in one of the GitHub repos. So another thing we have in the GitHub repository, open data sets. And so we have Varshni et al., which is a model of the Connectome. We have Nicoletti et al., which is our series of neuron models. These are biophysical models. We have the johnson mailer muscle model. We have this gate modulation model and others. So we have a number of things in our GitHub repository that are secondary data. We have computational models. And so a lot of that is available by just simply going to the GitHub repository and cloning the repository or forking it and working on it for yourself. So this is the DivaWorm repository. Um, this is distinct from the DivaLearn organization because at this site we have a lot of our legacy stuff so we've done we do a lot of stuff with computational development of biology and we work a lot on a lot of topics so there are a lot of repositories here that are sort of uh what we're doing with theory so those sorts of things aren't as github ready or github friendly but we do have repositories for them we have a meeting archive here and this kind of goes over our meeting history since 2020. So we've been on our YouTube channel since January of 2020. And we've gotten, you know, four years of archives here, just about, uh, maybe three and a half. And we, you know, we have the topics for each week and the speakers. So we've got a lot of things here. It, it's a good historical reference to complement our YouTube channel. So we also have a, a set of open data sets. And this is uh, the DivaWorm repository of DivaWorm. And so it's DivaWorm slash DivaWorm. This has a number of data sets in it. You'll find the data sets either in some sort of CSV file format or an Excel format. And the reason for that is we want to have that, we want to preserve that uh, common delimited aspect to it. And so this kind of tells you about these different data sets. So we have a lot of data for uh, raw nuclei, for cell birth and death timing, uh, differentiation trees, for embryo networks, for gene expression, lineage tree data, and positional info. So we have a lot of data sets that you can look at, and they're in that very uh, simple format. We also have the other data sets that I showed you before, which are some of the raw data sets. And if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, you can either create an issue on GitHub or talk about it in the Slack channel or come to one of the meetings. We also have something done in 2019, so it might be a bit dated for a lot of people. Uh, but this is a course we ran on DivaWorm machine learning. So this is a course that we I offered in the fall of 2019. And it was on current topics in machine learning, but related to developmental biology. So we had a number of things that came out of this. We had people give lectures, we had people give discussion, lead discussions, and we we kind of culminated this in a project that was a pre-trained model uh, that was sort of the basis for DivaLearn. So we did this course and, you know, it was, I think it was really productive in the sense of laying out a curriculum for developmental biology inspired machine learning or something like that. But there are a number of lectures you might want to check out here. Some of these are somewhat dated, but basically what we're trying to do is apply different machine learning techniques to 
different model organisms to different systems and to see what those look like. There's a lecture on input data, which is quite good, and that's probably independent of any one technology. There's also some things linking artificial neural networks and biological neural networks and some tutorials of things like TensorFlow. So we might do an update on this course, but the content from 2019 is here, and you might find this useful. So next up is our website, DevoWorm. And so this is where our group, uh, all of our work is accumulated. Uh, we've been around almost 10 years. So our 10-year 10, 10 anniversary is going to be on April 11th. And I'm going to, in a meeting near April 11th, I think it's like April 8th, I'm going to go over our 10 years of progress and, you know, have a presentation on that. So you're joining the or this organization right on its 10-year mark. And OpenORM has been around a little bit longer than that. OpenORM celebrated its 10th anniversary about two years ago. So we have a number of resources here. This is where you'll want to check out some of our publications. So we have a publications page, which has our publications in a number of areas. So our group has published a lot of things on C. elegans, but we've also published things on Drosophila. We've published things on the diatom Bacillaria, which diatoms are uh, algal organisms, single cell. We have comparative development, so we have papers where we've done comparisons of different organisms. So C. elegans and zebrafish, C. elegans, drosophila, uh, mice, and yeast. And then we have this paper where we compared C. elegans with a sea squirt called Ciona intestinalis. And so this, this is an area of interest for us, is looking at different types of development as well. And then finally, we have papers on theory and simulation type things, what they call in silico research. So these include things like hypergraphs and uh, cognitive morphogenesis and um, other types of things where we kind of really push the boundaries of computational developmental biology. We also have media and public lectures, which can be found off of the Education Notebooks and Media tab. So this kind of goes over some of our public lectures on our YouTube channel. And so this talk dimensions of morphogenesis is something that I recorded recently. I've put out a number of uh, overview videos. So you'll go through here and you can find different threads of our research that maybe aren't published, but still we we're doing work in that area. So we're doing work in different areas of morphogenesis. I have a talk on DevoLearn, the 10,000 meter view, which is a very good overview of DevoLearn and a lot of the software that we're building. So this includes DevoGraph and you know a lot of the machine learning work that we've been doing. I've also given updates to the OpenRoom Foundation. So I have year to year updates in here. I have some of our work on diatoms. Uh, some other topics, and some of the work we've done on networks, embryo networks, computational development, and neurosimulation. You might want to check that video out specifically if you're interested in DevoGraph. And then we've done a lot of work on networks. So I have a number of talks here down a little bit on network science in embryos and in biological systems. Uh, you know, ranging from embodied hypergraphs to some of the things that we've done with embryo networks, and that's, you know, matches up with some of our publications. We also have a lot of alumni of Google Summer of Code. So DevoWorm has been involved in Google Summer of Code since about 2017. And so I've been the mentor for all of those classes of people. So in 2022, we had four students. Uh, this is not updated for 2023, but in 2023, we had two students, Hermantia Shogol and Sushmanth Reddy. In 2022, we had four students. We had Wataro Kamakami, uh, Jia Hong Lee, who worked on DevoGraph, and then Karan Lohan and Hare Krishna Pillai, who worked on this digital microsphere project. And so we've had, we have a rich history, a rich association with Google Summer of Code. People have done a lot of projects, and we've kind of combined that all under DevoLearn. So there's the main DevoLearn platform, and then there's DevoGraph. And we hope to combine those two into one set of releases very soon. But we have to work on some technical details to make that happen. And that's where you come in if you're so interested. We also have a number of data sources. So this is not complete with respect to 
all that we have available. And so in addition to what's on the in the openworm repositories, we have these uh, other uh, data sets. These are available at Figshare, or sometimes they're on uh, GitHub, and sometimes they're just available online. They're online resources. So, you know, we do a lot of things with um, sort of secondary data. So it's been collected by other groups, and we've built a, a, a version of that, a cleaned up version of that those data, or sometimes there'll be things that we've generated from, you know, experimental evolution or from uh, simulations or whatever. So we have a number of things that you might find of interest with C. elegans. We have division event data, which is where you look at the divisions and development. We have the EPIC data set, which is raw microscopy data, which allows you to look at the sequence of events in cell division and cell differentiation in C. elegans. We have this other uh, digital development data set that uh, allows you to look at lineage phenotypes and to find those. We have data on our uh, DivaWorm GitHub repository as well. And that's different from the DivaLearn repository. DivaWorm has a number of data sets, which I think are linked here. But uh, those, those can, we can also discuss what data you actually need for a certain, to solve a certain problem. So we should talk about these things. Don't just go and grab data and start using it. But these data are available for you to look at uh, to get an idea of what you might want to do. We also have gene expression data, a lineage tree database. This is the original source paper on the lineage tree for C. elegans. This is a little bit more uh, data on like cell lineage differentiation. So they're different data sets for the same thing. And you can kind of get a sense of what the collected data look like for that thing. Uh, we also have positional information data, so the position of specific cells in an embryo. And we have data for other species like Siona intestinalis, Drosophila, and zebrafish. Finally, we're also affiliated with the Orthogonal Research and Education Laboratory. This is an organization that does uh, research in computational biology, but we also do things in simulation, cognitive science, and other areas as well. So we run a, a meeting called the Saturday Morning Neurosim Group, and that's where we talk about neurosimulation and some of the topics around neuroscience and simulation, computational methods, and very broadly construed. We talk about all sorts of things, actually, but focused on those things. So that's something you might want to be interested in. But this is our website for the Orthogonal Research uh, Lab. We have a number of affiliated projects. So Diva Worm and Open Worm are part of that. We're also interested in neuro AI, open source, informatics, and so forth. And we have a number of opportunities through there as well. We have two projects through the Orthogonal Lab this summer. We have one project on virtual reality and augmented reality and building assets for that. But we also have one on open source sustainability, which is the sustainability of open source projects. So if you don't find what you want in DevoGraph, you could apply to one of those projects as well. And then finally, I want to highlight our YouTube channel. So this is our YouTube channel where we have a lot of our meetings. I think all of our meetings are posted here. We also have a number of talks and we have a lot of playlists. So let's look at the playlists. So we have a number of playlists that, you know, they're basically conference talks, uh, you know, just informal talks about things, our lab meetings, different tutorials. Um, and so we do a lot of things. We do a lot of things with complex systems, dynamical systems. We participated in Dynamics Days. We participated in the network science community. Uh, we participated in some machine learning communities. And of course, we do a lot of stuff with computational developmental biology, theoretical concepts like heteroprony, and other types of things. So we have a, all of our channels here. I would take a look at this YouTube channel just to get a sense of what we do, what we've done in the past. And like I said, this is the 10th anniversary of DivaWorm. So later this year in April, I'll be going over the history in more detail to give you an, an idea of where, where we've been and where we want to go. So thank you for paying attention.
and good luck. Fork things accordingly and ask questions accordingly. Okay, it looks like we got a number of people here. <laughs> we got Paki and Sara and Vahid and Morgan. So hello. And Susan posted a citation here. Okay. Um, I'll send. Uh, I'll send you the paper. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Vahid, were, were you, did you want to give an update or? Uh, hi. Uh, uh, for this week, uh, not that not much update. Uh, I'm I'm going to uh, maybe. Because I was a little busy with something else this week, but uh, maybe in the next week I will uh, I will uh, pre notify you, and then we will, of course, uh, if that would be okay, I would be present. Yeah, yeah, just make sure you're on track, uh, getting things that you need. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've been discussing something with Patrick, uh, if uh, so it could be. To see if it would be possible to connect uh, everyone to CTO okay. uh, But uh, practically, uh, I'm still looking to see uh, where in the code uh, we shall uh, start with, and then uh, we would go on. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, that would be good if we could <laughs> have some sort of connection between the two. Um, be nice. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to get into, so in the group we've talked, uh, we have a long-standing interest in something called cellular automata. And cellular automata are these, uh, they're these grids you can build where you have cells and they have neighbors and they form neighborhoods. And the idea is you can do discrete computation on them, which means that you can simulate a process, you can uh, model pattern formation and other things by having these cells interact with each other. And you know, this has been a tool that's sort of abstract to a lot of problems, but it's yielded some really interesting results. In this case, interesting means that there's a lot of like, you know, uh, things that look lifelike or they look uh, like they're, you know, sort of these emergent patterns that form. And people, you know, they've been really valuable for a number of fields. So today I'm going to talk about something called Rule 30 and, you know, where it comes from and then how we can apply it to uh, different biological problems. We've talked about this for many, uh, several years, actually. We did some early work on cellular automata back in like 2016. Uh, and we, you know, we've, we've kind of not talked about it in recent years, but uh, it's still very interesting work. So Dick sent me some papers uh, on someone named Paul B. Green, who is a plant biologist, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So what is Rule 30? So this is Rule 30, and you can see these cellular automata here. There are these grid structures where you have these cells, and each cell is autonomous in the sense that they have their own set of rules. And these rules tell the cell how to, how to behave given the behavioral state of its neighbors. So for example, this cell here, it, you know, the, the cells can be in a state either on or off. In this case, they can be gray or white. And it's the same thing. It's a binary switch that gets triggered by these rules being satisfied. So this cell here has uh, a number of neighbors they're all adjacent cells. So in this case, it can have a neighborhood of four. It can have the cells to the top, to the bottom, to the left or the right. We're going to have nine neighbors or eight neighbors, which are all the cells touching that cell. And so the neighborhood definition is important because this cell will take the inputs of, or it will observe the state of all of its neighbors and then produce an output state based on that. So you know, this cell has uh, six neighbors that are gray and two neighbors that are white. And so this cell must have a rule that says, if any one of your neighbors is white, then remain white or tur remain turned on. Or if 
more than one of your neighbors is white, remain white, remain turned on. So, you know, you can set up all sorts of rules in these cells, and then there's this adjacency effect where its neighbors have neighbors, have neighbors. And each cell having its own rules, you know, means that they kind of behave not necessarily in the same way, but in a similar way. So each cell will either turn on or turn off. And, you know, making things more interesting, you might have cells that have a state that's determined by some stochastic process. So it's like flipping a coin, whether it's gray or white. And so then that kind of makes a difference in terms of local neighborhoods, the state of the local neighborhoods. And then that propagates across this grid. So this is rule 30. This is a this is uh, this model that's run over time. So you have all these cells. They have their own rules. They have their own interactions with their neighbors. Those interactions not only remain in those neighborhoods, but propagate across the grid. And you end up over time with these, these rules refreshing, the states of the cells refreshing, and you end up with this pattern. So over time, you get a pattern from what was basically before, either nothing where the entire grid was one state, or randomness where cells were randomly distributed in terms of their state. And so rule 30 is real, they're actually Stephen Wolfram uh, back in around 2002 published a book where he has like a hundred, over a hundred rules that can have, you know, you can have these different rules uh, that exist, uh, you know, and these rules of course are based on the rules of the cells and what those rules say. So there are over a hundred rules that, that yield different patterns if you run these simulations over time. And this is something called fundamental computation. In other words, what he's looking for here is sort of the fundamental aspects of computation, the fundamental aspects of, of pattern formation. And the analogy is, is that you can use a cellular automata to model any type of system, uh, probably just limited to discrete systems, but it should be universal across different systems. So we have this rule 30, it produces nice patterns, it produces them on this grid. You have this uh, matrix that shows you kind of how this works in a three bit register. So we can see with a three bit register, we have uh, all the possible states from 000 to 111. So, you know, we, we flip bits across these three binary states or these three binary values and we get eight states we get zeros and ones and the output here is is based on you know a number of criterion uh you know let's, let's so okay the new state for center cell would be zero if the current pattern is one 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 zero results in a zero one zero one results in a zero Zero, zero, zero results in a zero. And then all of the other states result in a one. And so, you know, there's something going on there with the rule. So if the left center and right cells are denoted PQR, then the corresponding formula for the next state of the center cell can be expressed as P exclusive OR, which is a logical function, QRR. And so it's, you know, in this case, you're using a logical function to update to the next cell. It is called rule 30 because in binary we have this uh, string and then that equals 30. So this is why they call it rule 30. Uh, so this is basically the rule 30 and you can have all sorts of patterns that emerge if you run the simulation long enough. This is a really complicated pattern of rule 30. This is where it really gets packed in and you get these sort of different uh, shaped triangles embedded in the pattern. So it's an interesting pattern, but what's interesting about it even more is that it's not just something that you see in a cellular automaton. You actually see it in uh, snail shells. So if we look at this uh, conus textile shell, which is a, a species of, uh, of uh, shelled mollusk, we can see that we have the same pattern or a very similar pattern emerge. And so the reason I bring up Rule 30 at all is because, A, it's this universal form of computation. We can explain it 
we know how it's generated. B, we see this, we can replicate this pattern and it has features that match something that we see in nature. So, you know, you might think, well, okay, well, maybe nature does the same thing. Maybe all the cells in this, in, in, during shell formation, the cells do the same type of interactions. They have these autonomous rules and they form these patterns. Which would be nice if that were the way it worked, but we don't exactly know the way it works, or at least we don't have, you know, we, we do have some mechanisms worked out, as we'll see, but we don't know exactly how that would work. You know, why would that work? Uh, so that's that's an interesting thing. It's an interesting observation, and, you know, at, at least it's analogically correct in that they both look the same. But did they get there in the same way? So I have some papers here on Rule 30. So this is uh, from Wolf, the Wolfram Atlas of Simple Programs. So again, this is something Stephen Wolfram has worked on. And, you know, he has all these rules worked out, kind of showing the rule properties, uh, simple initial conditions. You can randomize the initial condition. And you can, you know, there's the ensemble properties and the finite state properties. Basically ways to analyze it and understand it. So we have all the mathematical tools we need to understand it, more or less. We talked about this Wikipedia article. This is a paper actually that talks about the complex dynamics emerging in Rule 30 with majority memory. So not only does Rule 30 replicate things that you see in biology, and it produces complex outputs that look like their pattern formation, but they also have this sort of complex dynamics on their own. And so that might lead to things like, you know, uh, different types of uh, uh, different types of uh, systems that can be simulated with this. So there are a lot of complex dynamics. This is complex dynamics emerging in Rule 30 with majority memory. So there's a memory component that gets uh, added to Rule 30, and then they look at this in this paper, uh, you know, how this works. So the abstract for this uh, is in cellular automata with memory, the unchanged maps of the conventional cellular automata are applied to cells endowed with memory of their past states in some specified interval. So they have this Rule 30, they apply it to a cellular automata. They, you know, the rules get updated, the pattern is sort of emerges or changes accordingly. And then, but then there's also this memory. So now each cell, aside from having an autonomous rule, also has a memory of its past states. We implement Rule 30 automata with a majority memory and show that using the memory function, we can transform the quasi-chaotic dynamics of classical Rule 30 into domains of traveling structures with predictable behavior. So as you saw in the Wikipedia article, they talk about uh, chaos and chaotic behavior. So they talk about Rule 30 meeting the rigorous definitions of chaos proposed by Devaney and Knudsen. In particular, Devaney's criteria According to that, Rule 30 displays sensitive dependence on initial conditions, which is something that you see in chaos theory. Basically, wherever you start your system, if you start your system here, it's going to yield a much different pattern than if you start your system here. It just depends on what the initial condition is. So if I randomize my cells across the grid, it gives me a much different uh, result than if I start with something that's seeded to be like sort of this quasi pattern. So it's an important point because we don't, you know, we don't know necessarily the developmental origins of Rule 30 or seashells for that matter. I mean, we know the, the developmental origins, but we don't know like if that's something that's just random or if it has like a, a sort of a reason why it's there. So that's, and of course, in chaos, of course, we have you know, a lot of interactions and we have a system that is, uh, has the sensitive dependence, but can also, you know, there's this whole uh, language in, in 
dynamical systems and chaos theory that describes sort of the boundary between order and chaos and what that is. So chaos is a very, uh, there's a very deep set of properties and it's not just saying that it's chaotic, uh, but, you know, but we'll leave that aside for now. So in this paper, they uh, can transform quasi-chaotic dynamics of classical Rule 30. So Rule 30, you'll see these patterns form, and sometimes you'll lose them. Sometimes you'll lock on to certain patterns given the uh, a certain initial condition and things like that. So it's not just random behavior. It's it's ordered behavior, but it, it achieves it in a chaotic way. Uh, and so the transform this into domains of traveling structures with predictable behavior. And so that means that you have not only these fixed patterns, but that you get patterns that move, you know, you things that move around and they're patterned. So this is predictable behavior that we can recognize as a pattern. We analyze morphological complexity of the automata and classify dynamics of gliders, particle self-localizations. Gliders are things like, you know, different clumps of cells that sort of move across the grid and they glide across the grid together, meaning that that rule sort of propagates across the grid. All the cells have these underlying rules, the same rules, but the activity rather propagates across the grid. Uh, so this is one of the features that really people kind of point to to say, this really looks lifelike, these glide, the existence of these gliders. Uh, in the memory enriched rule 30. We provide formal ways of encoding and classifying glider dynamics using De Bruyne diagrams, soliton reactions, and quasi chemical representations. So, this is a classic Andy, Adam, Andy Adamatsky paper, and that it has a lot of this unconventional computation in it. And they do this encoding and classification of these gliders. So, I don't know if they give an example of the glider. This is uh, the effect of majority memory of increasing depth on rule 30, starting from a single site live cell. So this gives you this ahistoric summary, and then you have this memory where there's this depth. So you get something that propagates outward, you get these different effects of memory. So the pattern changes as they implement memory. Uh, So this is the typical behavior of rule 30, where a single cell in state one leads to a chaotic state. That's here on the left. And then the second configuration shows automaton behavior from a random initial condition with initial density of 50% for each state. And that's on the right. Both automata evolve on a ring of 497 cells. And so you can see the differences in the patterns with the different initial condition. So De Bruyne diagrams are basically these trees or these graphs that show kind of the states uh, for Rule 30. So they break down Rule 30 into this uh, diagram. And these use a lot actually in, uh, in genomics, in bioinformatics. So these are useful tools. Um, and then this, of course, is a a much larger De Bruyne, De Bruyne diagram that shows Rule 30 as it evolves. And so, yeah, we get this sort of memory state. So people have uh, simulated Rule 30. And again, depending on the initial condition, it gives you a different set of patterns. But we also have this majority memory aspect that can show, you know, significant evolution across the run. So you can run this Rule 30, you can get all sorts of random states, but you can get these highly patterned states that look like this. So it's clearly more than just an analogy with biology. You can actually do a lot of analysis of Rule 30 and see if this is something that looks like it's biological, if it's replicating things in the biological world. Okay, so we have these, uh, this paper goes on and talks about some of the ways we can analyze Rule 30. And so then, you know, we might say, okay, well, what are the mechan computational mechanisms in an organism that might lead to this? And that's what we're going to get into next. I just wanted to finish off with this. This is uh, a little image of Rule 30 on a four-cell uh, neighborhood, just showing the different way the different states evolve. So 
you know, in seashells, of course, we get this kind of patterning. And, you know, seashell development occurs kind of from, an, you know, from a early stage. And you get these shells that form. So this is showing a shell and how it's accreting from the inside out. And it's forming this pattern. So it's showing this conical shell and it's wrapping around. This, is, this animation is just showing how this pattern kind of proceeds around the shell. So this pattern kind of the, the cone, the conical uh, shell unfurls from the center and it comes outward. And so this whole surface then gets patterned and, you know, you might say, well, okay, you have cells here that uh, behave like this. They interact with their neighbors and they form these patterns. And then you get this shell and the patterns might be useful for some purpose. We don't know, but, you know, they may basically form like rule 30. So what are the mechanisms that kind of govern this? Is this all cell autonomous or is there something else going on here? So this is a paper that was published quite a while ago. This was in um, 2009. And this is actually by a number of neuroscientists. So now we're throwing neuroscientists into the mix here. And this paper is The Neural Origins of Shell Structure and Pattern in Aquatic Mollusks. So this is, uh, the abstract reads, we present a model to explain how the neurosecretory system of aquatic mollusks generates their diversity of shell structures and pigmentation patterns. The anatomical and physiological basis of this model sets it apart from other models used to explain shape and pattern. So this is where they're proposing a model for the generation of these shell structures and their diversity and their pigmentation patterns. So this is actually a neurosecretory model. So it doesn't necessarily match up with rule 30, at least initially. But they're going to produce a model that kind of explains how this works. And this is going to be, you know, sort of tied to the brain of the mollusks or the neural mechanisms. So this is interesting, the way they're doing this. Uh, the anatomical and physiological basis of these models sets it apart from other models. The model reproduces most known shell shapes and patterns and accurately predicts how the pattern alters in response to environmental disruption and subsequent repair. So, you know, we didn't see an example of Rule 30 being repaired so that, you know, some of were automata. One could take a chunk out of it and, like, watch the thing regenerate. So you could reset a number of the cells to zero or to one state or another, and you could watch the pattern fill in. Or maybe it wouldn't. We don't really know because I don't think anyone's done that particular experiment. But the idea is that in biological systems, we get this sort of repair mechanism and the pattern gets repaired in a certain way. They also have environmental effects. So mollusks are very sensitive to environmental conditions fluctuating. They live in, in the, uh, they live in, in estuaries. So you have water chemistry and temperature that are very important in kind of shaping the development of these structures. So that's the kind of thing we want to have in a model as well. Finally, we connect the model to a larger class of neural models, and so that's what they do. Um, so they talk about, let's see, um, they talk a little bit about the biology of the shells. Uh, early attempts to reproduce shell patterns use cellular automata models in which arbitrary rules determine the pigmentation of cells on a grid. These are the citations. Although they can reproduce some observed patterns, these models have shed little light on how such patterns actually arise in the animal. So inspired by the chemistry of diffusing morphogens, Meinhardt and co-workers, and these are the citations here, used a variety of different diffusion reaction models to reproduce a wide variety of shell pigmentation patterns. So diffusion reaction models are the same type of models that we see with respect to uh, uh, Turing morphogenesis. So if you've heard of Turing morphogenesis, that's what diffusion reaction models are. And so there are a number of classes of that. We have a lecture on the YouTube channel uh, that I put out earlier this year in January on morphogenesis. 
And I talk about some of the different models of morphogenesis for one dimensions, two dimensions, and three dimensions. So this is an interesting thing to go back to and look at in light of this paper and some of the Rule 30 stuff. So what they're saying here is that Rule 30, it, you know, it, although it produces patterns that look biological, it isn't sufficient to really explain how they arise. And so then they talk, turn to these diffusion reaction models that can re also reproduce a wide variety of shell pigmentation patterns. Although no experimental evidence has been found for diffusing morphogens in patterning, the models can be viewed as an incomplete analogy for neural activity. So this is, again, something that invites sort of a neural explanation, involvement of the nervous system. But we don't really have a, a mechanism worked out. So they sort of, you know, they sort of rival the Rule 30 model or the, the Rule 30 approach, but they don't quite get there. So both the neural and, and diffusion reaction models allow different ways of describing the phenomena of local excitation with lateral inhibition. And so that's what they're interested in is this local excitation with lateral inhibition. So basically, if we go back to Rule 30, we can model that with rules that say, you know, in our neighborhood, we have certain rules for excitation. We have certain rules for inhibition. Maybe if our lateral neighbors are excited, then we're inhibited. We, we're in a different state than our neighbors. If a majority of our neighbors are turned on, then we also turn on. Rules like that. We can model this kind of uh, excitation and inhibition, but we can also model it with uh, like connectionist models or neural network models. And so that's some of the other stuff that people have done working on these kind of concepts. Um, and so this is, this is the thing we want to do, though. We want local excitation with lateral inhibition. Uh, Ernest, Ernst Mach uh, first described this phenomena to explain the visual illusions now called Mach bands. So Mach bands are these visual illusions uh, that you can look up. Uh, and, you know, he did a lot of early psychophysics and, you know, it's just something that you'll see in visual neuroscience a lot. And emphasized the properties of this model of enhancing boundaries. So uh, local excitation with lateral inhibition allows for enhancing boundaries. We also see this with uh, reaction diffusion. <coughs> we also see this with reaction diffusion models and the way they behave as well. Nearly a century later, Alan Turing showed how LALI, which is the acronym for local excitation with lateral inhibition, could be modeled by systems of nonlinear diffusion reaction equations. This property is exploited by later workers, most notably Murray and Meinhardt, to model an extraordinary range of biological patterns. And so this is the diffusion reaction models have become an all-purpose lolly metaphor in many domains, wherein the underlying physics are clearly not diffusing substances. All these models exhibit spatial instabilities that lead to spatial patterns. So we get the spatial patterning, but we first need spatial instabilities, and we don't necessarily need diffusing substances. We just need an underlying physics of inhibition and excitation. And so we can look at that. We can see in development, we can get this sort of thing. We get spatial instabilities. Those things propagate into spatial patterns like we saw with Rule 30 and the propagation of things from one neighborhood to other neighborhoods or gliders which move across the grid. Uh, the neural shell model presented here combines spatial with temporal instability because the mantle can sense previously laid patterns by looking backwards in time. So they actually have this neural shell model that it looks backwards in time. And so then it brings in some aspects of memory. In this case, you're not adding a computational memory so much as you're adding in some neural mechanism. Uh, Lolly in time is equivalent to a refractory period that leads to temporal oscillations. Um, and so Meinhardt's diffusion reaction models have succeeded in reproducing almost all of the patterns quite accurately, and we can hardly do better here. Our goal, however, is not to merely reproduce the patterns, but to show how a single net neural network model based directly on the mantle anatomy can capture all of the pattern complexity, as well as constructing the shell shape, and relate that model to a broader class 
of experimentally observed neural network behavior. So this is interesting how they kind of bring this different type of model to bear on this problem. So they argue that this is a neurosecretory process, uh, that there are secretions in the uh, periostracal groove, which is a part of the anatomy of the mollusk, are controlled by underlying neural networks synapsing on the secretory cells. So we have a neural network in the brain of the mollusk, and it's synapsing on secretory cells, and it's actually controlling the release of secretions that produce these patterns. So it's actually, you know, if we can think of like a rule, uh, cellular automata cell implementing rule 30. Rule 30 in this case is actually being triggered by, say, like some small neural network that's synapsing onto that single cell. And in fact, you can do this uniformly across the grid, or you can do this in other ways. And so that's what they're kind of arguing, that there's this network mechanism or this neural mechanism that's kind of controlling these secretions and their pulsation and, you know, managing interactions between different cells. The activity of this neural network is stimulated by the existing pattern of shell deposition and pigment at the mantle edge. So we saw that animation where the, the shell was scrolling outward. And we saw that, you know, the mantle edge is sort of the, the middle of the shell. And as it comes out, you're sort of refreshing your state. So as, this, as the, the shell kind of develops kind of coming outward like that, you get, you know, uh, previous states are, are being consulted, I guess, in a way that determines the next state. So in a sense, you know, it's as dependent, it's as sensitive to initial condition as rule 30, but it's not the same thing because you do have this memory that's built up over the course of shell deposition. The shell is constructed by periodic, usually daily, bouts of secretion. So this is a pulsatile thing where you get these daily bouts of secretion and, you know, thus it's, it's uh, probably influenced by the environment of the mollusk. So it could be like the temperature, temperature gradient, or it could be the uh, water chemistry or things like that can, that can affect it. These periodic increments are robust against many kinds of environmental variations, but not all, of course. You, you always have environmental variation, but, you know, it can be affected by large-scale fluctuations. We model the secretion in daily steps, wherein the pattern of each day's layer of secretions is a function of pre-existing layers. And so this is an example here of the shell-making machinery. You have this dorsal epithelium here. You have the secretory cells here. You have the shell kind of coming out from that secretory cell. You have sensory cells synapsing on this uh, periostrical groove. You have the circumpelial axon, and then you have the pallial nerves. So the secretory cell and the sensory cells are linked by this uh, network of, I guess, two neurons, and they're kind of linking those two things together. So it's sensing things, and then it's secreting things, basically, a small network of, of cells. And this is all within this periostrical groove, so it's producing a pattern, and that's, that's what we have. So that's the shell making machinery. And then, of course, we have this lateral inhibition. So we see that, like in the shell, we can get these stripes. So lateral inhibition and, and boundary formation just mean that you have, you know, like you have in um, Turing morphogenesis, you have this, these gradients that come together and they form a boundary because they kind of uh, sort of meet at a point and there's sort of this sharp distinction between the two gradients. Uh, in this case, you get lateral inhibition in certain conditions, under certain conditions, and you get the striping. And so you can see that local excitation and lateral inhibition work hand in hand. You get this lateral inhibition here and local excitation in the middle, and that's where you get these bands. And so you've got this worked out in terms of a model. They've defined an activation inhibition signal, and then you see this new pigment deposition here. This is an example of sort of the structure in terms of space. So you have the amplitude here and the pattern. So you, you can go across space, you can go across time, of course. This unfurls over space and time. The structure is actually a spatiotemporal structure. 
Uh, so this is an interesting. So this is these are spiral shaped shells. And then they show this in terms of dynamical systems, turning bifurcations, hop bifurcations, which are dynamical systems tools. Um, and then we have this Turing hop bifurcation. So we have these dynamical systems that result, or these dynamics that result from a lot of this activity. We can analyze this using dynamical systems theory. We can also look at the outcome in different species. And actually, we see a lot of different, a, a real large diversity of patterns that result from these kind of mechanisms. Okay, so that's uh, enough about that paper. I did want to talk about one more set of things, and this is in phylotaxis. So I misspelled phylotaxis in this, but uh, so phylotaxis are in plants, and it's the way in which leaves are arranged in phylotaxis. Uh, so the way that leaves are arranged in spiral patterns and other types of branching patterns that uh, they're basically leaf arrangements. And so a lot of times phyllotaxis are these sort of, you know, they, they occur in these spirals like this, or they occur in these uh, oppositional branching patterns. So phyllotaxis is from the Greek meaning arrangement of leaves. Phyllotaxy is the arrangement of leaves on a plant stem. And you get, sometimes you get these spirals, but you get other patterns as well. So this is basically, you know, this happens in every kind of uh, plant. You get these kind of uh, leaf arrangements. And it really depends on sort of the way that morphogenesis proceeds as to what you get. So, uh, you know, with an opposite leaf arrangement, two leaves arise from the stem at the same level and at the same node, which is here. So in opposite sides of the stem. An opposite leaf pair can be thought of as a whorl of two leaves. So you see this, this complex whorl here, which looks pretty uh, dense. It's just the same type of mechanism as you see here, where you have these opposite leaves kind of shooting out at different nodes. So these are the nodes here where you have these leaves that emerge. You'll find, you can find the nodes in this crisscrossing spiral as well, if you look. And that's basically how this... this uh, process works. So you have dis, uh, dystychus phyllotaxis, which are the two ranked leaf arrangements, which are these examples here. And then if successive leaf pairs are 90 degrees apart, this habit is called desiccate. And, or desiccate. It, it is common in members of the fam these families, uh, some families of plants. Uh, desiccate phyllotaxis also occurs in a number of other uh, order, or I guess these are uh, genera. Many species have just have just two fully developed leaves at a time, the older pair folding back and dying off to make room for the desiccately oriented new pair as the plant grows. So there are a lot of different ways that this can happen. Uh, the point of this, though, is to talk about some of the sort of the unified rules that, that occur. So there's this paper, the unified rule of phyllotaxis explaining both spiral and non-spiral arrangements. Uh, and this paper talks about some of the leaf-like appendages uh, and how they're organized. So they're organized as spiral and nine spiral arrangements. Um, the adaptive reason for this morphological convergence is unknown. And so in this paper, they talk about the different angles of arrangements and how these can be sort of, uh, they're sort of mathematically optimal. Uh, they talk about the the golden mean here, but you know, these are things that, of course, like we talked about before with Rule 30, there's this universal computation that seems to be at play here. And so they propose a unified rule of phyllotaxis to explain both types of arrangement. In this case, the developed leaf the developed leaves form vertical rows along the stem. In the non sporular arrangement, nascent and developed leaves always follow this rule so that the number of leaf rows is kept constant irrespective of stem growth. In the square rule arrangement, developed leaves attain this rule by adjusting the divergence angle from the golden angle. So they give this sort of mathematical explanation. Then there's the work of Paul B. Green, which Dick talked about. He brought this up to my attention, and I did find some papers from Paul B. Green. We were trying to find, I don't remember what the conversation was, 
but we did find a number of papers. I did find two papers by Paul B. Green that have to do with these phylotactic patterns. And this is one from the Journal of Theoretical Biology, characterization by geometrical activity at the formative region. And this kind of talks about some of these, uh, you know, aspects of phylotaxis and kind of getting at, um, so I guess he was a plant biologist. So, you know, they were interested in sort of, again, the Fibonacci series and describing biotaxis using that mathematical tool. Uh, but there are a number of diff other types of uh, uh, patterns that you find in nature, helical sequences and other things. And so there's a circular aspect to it that they, they kind of talk about here. Um, so this is the tool they're using for phylotaxis are these um, these Fibonacci sequences. And then this other paper on the me mechanism of deficit uh, phylotaxis, biophysical studies of the tunica layer of Vinca major, which is a species of plant. And so they're, they talk about, uh, you know, more of this. They talk about the, sort of the geometry of the plant and how that uh, responds to the environment. So it's interesting uh, work, but it still leaves open this question about Rule 30 and about how we model biological things. So, you know, is Rule 30 maybe something that's sufficient for modeling these kind of phenomena? Could we just get away with using Rule 30 and be good? Or, you know, do we need to adopt a model that's more based in biology? And, you know, how do they interact? So, you know, we've, we've been introduced to Rule 30, and that sort of explains the phenotype. The mechanism for seashell, you know, uh, formation, some people argue, has a neural component. And so there are a lot of aspects of uh, lateral inhibition that play into that. We also can go to more traditional models of uh, morphogenesis, like Turing morphogenesis, reaction diffusion. And those serve well, but they don't explain everything. And then we can turn to biotaxis and look at how people model that. And they model that very differently. And they model that with a Fibonacci sequence. And so all these models, you know, you have to think about the consequences. Like, can you get, uh, you know, complex dynamics out of them? Can you understand sort of the way that these things develop in terms of the dynamics and not just like static snapshots? So that's that's uh, my overview of Rule 30 and some of the things that are related to it. Okay, yeah, Nick, Nick came in. Welcome, Dick. So do we have any comments or questions about that? Was it, would you like my pictures of shells? Of what? Shells. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, I have took some pictures of Dick's shells. Oh yeah, yeah, the shells. Uh, well, I was I found my found this. Um, I'm supposed to send this to you with images of the eggs and shells. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be good. That'd be okay. good. All right. Uh, I'm in the process of contacting Tam Dick. I did get your email though. So yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah, so yeah, we've had this. Uh, Dick has wanted to do some experiments with shells where you mount them on a mount and you rotate them around and you do three-dimensional imaging of the surface. So you get an account of like different shells and what their surface looks like. And that would be kind of, we never really found the right technology to do that uh, in the way we want to do it. So yeah. I don't know. Um, my images are just with a 3D microscope, so uh, it doesn't do depth the way I want it to, and it's only three megapixel cameras, and I would like yeah. um, better cameras. Yeah. Oh, Dick corrected me in saying it's a 2D unwrapping of the shell. So you take images of the shell, and you can unwrap it into a 2D, or unfurl it into a 2D surface. So it's like taking a 3D and making it 2D. But that requires a specific way of doing it. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you'd have to take my images and map them onto a surface, and then you'd have to take the surface and unwind it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's also like projections. So like, you know, when you take a surface of the, or when you take like the the world, of course, is a globe and you take the surface of a globe and you flatten it out to make a two dimensional map of the world. You have to choose a projection to preserve the features. And so, you know, there are a lot of projections you can use and they use this and other things as well in geometry. And so those projections basically preserve what's happening at the poles and align them with what's happening at the equator. And yeah, but that's, yeah, that's a, that's a different thing. So Susan's, he says, no, Susan, just take the closest column and image at each angle. So. Yeah. Well, I just use my camera and took sequential pictures of each side. So that's four, uh, one on the top, four at, this angle and four at this angle and then one on the bottom. So, yeah. I'll, I'll send them to you to see what you think. Maybe I need to um, fix my my camera somehow. Just suggestions as to how I can improve my 3D microscope. I'm getting some new act models this week, so. Yeah. Mosaic of columns, images one degree apart. So it's like stacking them together like that. Just taking slices and putting them together. Well, I'll, I'll send you these, see what you think. Um, okay, yeah. That would be good. Um, yeah. So any other comments or questions? Um, no, nope, I'm just... Working through the math for ten segregates, and um, it's a linear algebra, and it's about indeterminate math. Okay. So non-invertible um, matrices, uh, because um, the structures are indeterminate. Okay. And they too depend on. Um, initial conditions somewhat. Right, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, for tensegrity, that's pretty important. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I can't I can't build them like I would a bridge, anyways. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I think uh, some of the GSOC people or people interested in GSOC may have missed the beginning of the meeting where I went over the project. And that is actually available on Neurostars, which is neurostars.org. INCF has a repository of all the project uh, descriptions that they're supporting. So ours is uh, project 4.1. And so please look that, that description over. And you know, again, you can contribute to any part of that you would like. Propose something, you know, write a proposal saying, I want to do this thing that contributes to advancing this project. So we have a lot of things to do in that project, but I would, you know, communicate with me. Uh, and, you know, before you write your proposal, that would be the best way to do it. And then we can talk about how that fits into the longer term vision of the graph neural networks or DevoGraph approach that we're doing. Uh, Dick said that, uh, yes, Susan, where would you cross an indeterminate tensegrity bridge? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cells work in this environment, yeah. Do you have any, uh, Susan, do you have any ideas about like what the differences between biological tensegrity are and things like a bridge where you would like mechanical tensegrity, I guess. Um, well, cells are, are you could see they're a spider's web. They're a more of a tensegrity dome than, um, than a tensegrity. Like they're, um, they're held together with uh, actin rings. 
all the way across the surface and and um, tri junctions and high junctions and quad junctions, <laughs> junctions just between the cells. So it's it's not a spider's web exactly, but you know it's um it it it's basically based on hexagons, but it's hexagons are only the average of the type of shape you get. Okay. On the surface. So it's a tiling, but it's a flexible tiling and it's it's stable because it's it's held at the edges. Like it sort of holds itself up. But it, it's and then it's influenced by the space though. So it's also influenced by its 3D structure. So yeah. it's the surface structure, but it's influenced by its base, how it's held. So uh, try to get a mathematical construct of that. It's like, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's something. No, it certainly moves around. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. So I think that's. Oh, Morgan, you want to say something? Okay. Oh, are you going to say something, Morgan? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, no, I hit the wrong button. Okay. Uh, just, just heading out for a school run. All right. All right. So I guess that's it for today. Uh, thank you for attending. And uh, if you want to present anything to the group, we let me know. We can do it. Um, otherwise, uh, keep in touch on email and Slack and all the places where we keep in touch. And uh, see you next week. <laughs>